Technical Information Management session. I would like you to I would like to introduce the moderator Paul Bossman. Mr. Paul Bossman has worked for Eurocontrol over 25 years in many different roles and functions. He's now the head of ATM Strategies Division, which includes Eurocontrol contribution to the European ATM Master Plan, Architecture, SWIM, international cooperation, support to deployment, and ARPA's U.S. activities. He is the agency member of the ICAO Information Management Panel and was the chairman of the AIS-IMSJ. Paul, floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Are we live? Okay, so the first thing I need to tell you, and I'm going to tell you the number of times, is that we're going to be using Pigeonhole. Roberta, you see? Take one. Yeah. Pigeonhole.at, login IKO. This is please where you should uh, put all your questions. Yeah? We may not have time to answer all of them in the session, but they will definitely be recorded and taken further into the next steps of this activity. Okay, what we have here for you is a session on aeronautical information management. And when I started my career many, many years ago in Eurocontrol, this was referred to me as the ugly duck of the family. It is there where you would put your failed controllers. These are where you would see people in Hawaiian t-shirts and flip-flops, etc. And you should not worry too much about them. They're just there to retire one day and it's all over. Yeah? Dell, this is not the truth. Uh, this is not the situation anymore. And over the last five or ten years, ICAO uh, did a great effort in trying to improve uh, the regulations and provisions around aeronautical information management. And the way they did, that, they did that is through, through the setup of what they call the ASAM study group. Uh, many of us, or quite a number of us, are actually in this room here. And they uh, had as an objective to really move from what they called AIS, the old traditional paper-based AIS, into AIM, digital high-quality aeronautical information management. The achievements and deliverables of this study group over the last 10 years are a roadmap, a big amendment 36, where it's introduced already the first notions of automation, electronic AOP, etc. A big amendment 37 that came out for 2013, where again many more elements around automations, uh, aeronautical or airport mapping things, etc. And brand new from the press or coming out of the ANC review and going to council review is the latest Annex 15 Amendment 40 and the creation of a brand new PANS AIM document, application date 2018. So from a SARPS point of view, ICAO has done a tremendous effort updating, bringing AIS into AIM and truly into the 21st century. You say, ah, but SARPs are not enough, and indeed, and that's why they are working hard to come up with a whole set of guidance material in four different volumes, all coming out in November of this year. So, what else is there to do? And that's the objective of this session here, where we're going to have the views from ANISP, from IATA, from industry. Uh, first of all, how they look at the situation. Is it as bright as I'm trying to depict it here? Or is there maybe one or two things still to be done? And then we have Roberta from IKEO giving us an overview of what is further in the pipe. Yeah? Again, we're counting very much on your contributions. Pigeonhole.at, log in with IKEO, and please put all your questions there. If we don't like the question, we'll remove it anyway, and otherwise we'll try to pick up all the other ones. Okay? With that said, the first speaker is Stefan de Beer, with whom we're working for a long time together. He's the head of the research and development within AIS France in DSNA. Stefan has been the French member of the study group and is the current chairman of the Eurokai RTCA Committee on Aeronautical Databases, and he also has one or two other hobbies. Stefan, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, and I'll try to focus mainly on the, the AIM hobby because we only have five minutes each, so uh, it will be my pleasure to provide you with uh, feedback from our experience within the French and ANSP in moving this AIM concept into operations. So actually, uh, the move from AIS to AIM is usually referred to as moving from paper to digital. Okay, it looks simple. So why does it take so long? Because in fact, moving to digital in article information covers a number, at least three uh, evolutions, not to say revolutions. First, we move from the artwork where we used to do cartography in a traditional way to databases, geographical information systems, data models, etc. So it's much more te technical than it used to be. But it's also a cultural evolution. People in AIS, they've been dealing with paper products for more than 50 years. 
So even if they've got databases, they when they look at the final outcome, they say, oh, OK, but how does it look on the page? Does it fit in one page or not? Or do, we, do I need two pages? And we need to change this to make sure that data becomes the key reference and not paper. Uh, and the third thing is that it's not only technical and uh, cultural, but also uh, there are new skills that are required, new competencies, so it's really organizational uh, change. And there's a need for change management to move to uh, uh, implementation. The cornerstone of, uh, of this move that we experience is data quality. It's good to have a quality management system, but we also need that collaborative approach, end-to-end -end approach. As you can see on the picture, it's good to have a brand new system, but if you put garbage in the system, what you get at the end is garbage. You don't expect to watch nice movies just by uh, buying the new flat screen TV. You also need the broadcast to be taken into account. And um, finally, our feedback from experience is that uh, it's a continuous improvement. It's not that thing, quality, that you tick, okay, done. Because data quality is a continuous effort that keeps going with new data, new types of data, more data, as we see in the SWIM evolution. The benefits of AIM to us are obvious. We've got uh, uh, more efficient processes, we've got the ability to feed our various ATM systems, and we provide va value-added uh, services for our customers. But even if we consider in the SNA that we, we are now in AIM, it's not over yet. We still have some elements of the transition to cover. In particular, we still have what we refer to as NOTAM proliferation, a lot of NOTAMs. This, uh, Digital NOTAM, this has been a concept that we have been working on, we've been doing trials, we've been doing demonstration, we have nice PowerPoints, but it's not live, at least in our ANSP and in some other ANSPs around us. Uh, charting is also something that we need to work on a little bit because we tackle a lot the paper AIP, etc., but not really the uh, automation of charting. And there's also that ETARD acronym that has been subject to many discussions in AIM over the past few years, electronic terrain obstacle data. How do we manage this amount of data? How do we maintain them over time? How do we acquire them at a reasonable financial level? Now, oh, there is also another topic that is to be monitored in the next few years, which is the uh, liability issues about data. Maybe that doesn't change, but there's more and more data that are exchanged. There are more and more uh, legal frameworks, like open uh, access to data to the public, etc. And so we need to take care of this. We probably also need to consider if there is a minimum data set to be provided, like we used to have in paper with the integrated article information package. Lastly, uh, there are evolutions that are coming in. We uh, heard about them during this conference, especially the drone area that uh, has clear demand for real-time information on a number of equipment. And that's where the beauty of SWIM appears because we can embed our AIM domain into SWIM, providing uh, the information as services. Actually, this is the next move. We've been talking about data, 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 and information, information, information over the last few years. I think in the next few years, we'll talk about services, services, and services. Thank you very much. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Stefan, for this. Uh, I think the, the, the red line in the presentation is clear. This is about change, about, about embracing the change, whether it is skydiving, as we saw in the previous session, or slightly less adventurous, <laughs> is still to be seen. Uh, but it is really about embracing the change. It's not only about technology, new products and services, but it's really it's cultural changes, it's organizational changes, etc. I mean, and I've been witnessing this, for, uh, for example, with the French AIS. I've been visiting it several times over the last years. It is remarkable how the place has changed over the last 10, 15 years. It's, you've got a new set of people walking around with new, train, with new trained skills, etc. They are embracing this whole digitalization, but it doesn't come without its challenges. And how good it really is, is what Jean-Francois from IATA will tell us, where the airlines are getting what they want and what they pay for, or so what they think. And therefore, Jean-Francois, Assistant Director, ICAO Relations for IATA, and the nominated representative in the ICAO Information Management Panel, there I need 
need to say even the chair, uh, and participant to the AKO ATM RPP. Jean-Francois, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning everyone. So we've heard you know, what the NSPs are, are willing to do for us and let me show you on that first slide you know, when NSPs are starting to provide digital AIPs, you know, what are the kind of benefits that we expect. And Paul might have been saying you know, that it was you know, the kind of you know, the, the bad duck, but it's quite important you know, for us to have good quality AIM information. Because what it does for us you know, is that it facilitates getting customized content which allow the airlines you know, to better plan their flights, and that's quite important. Then it also reduces the workload for the airline performance engineers, because those guys you know, are the ones that are planning the flight, you know, what kind of rate of climb would be used, what are, you know, how long the flight is going to take, how much fuel the aircraft needs to take, and a lot of that is dependent on the good quality AIM information, and making that digital helps consolidating all the information together. And if I take a couple of examples here, Digital airport mapping information helps optimize the taxi time. And you don't save much, you know, but saving one or two minutes per day per aircraft on every given airport you know, at the end of the year makes big money. So it's important you know, that this information is available. And I think the third example is even more critical, although you know, a bit more challenging to get according to, uh, to Stefan, which is the digital terrain data, you know, which is all the information regarding the airport's information, the obstacles around the airport. Because if you have that information in a digital format that you can trust the information, then you can derate your climb, which is you know, really optimize your rate of climb according to what is the environment around the airport. As of today, we have to put maximum thrust in a lot of airports because you know, we've been told that there were obstacles. And in the end, you know, when you are there and it's too late to change, you discover that the, the obstacles are not, either not here or they are more than what you expect. So you have to change you know, your, your settings and it's not good. And each saving you can make on an engine thrust you know, is increasing the time between two maintenance cycles and, and it's quite important you know, to, to save on that. Of course, you know, if you know where the obstacles are, you can better plan and make fuel savings as well. You are also able to better respect the noise and emission restrictions that are put in the airport if you exactly know how you can navigate you know, along the different obstacles and the, the, air, the uh, limitations at the airport. And finally, you have even bigger savings because at the moment, as we cannot trust some of the airport mapping data that we get, you know, we send people at each of the airport that an airline is serving to do their own survey. And it's not our duty. You know, it should be done by the NSP, by the authority to ensure that we have good quality information. When it's becoming digital, hopefully that will save us a lot of travel time and survey times you know, in order to get that information. So, those are the benefits that we expect and just a few examples, but we are not there yet and, and we see, still see a lot of fragmentations in how the standards that Paul were mentioning you know, are implemented and used by states. So what we would need and hopefully that guidance that was mentioned will allow states you know, to apply those standards in a consistent manner. Because as we fly everywhere, you know, we need to have a consistent application of the standards to make sure that we can operate in the most efficient way. Then quality is not always there. And I think, you know, <laughs> I didn't discuss with Stefan before, but, you know, the same message. If you don't have quality data in, you might apply the best quality process. You know, in the end, what you get, you know, is the same garbage that you had at the beginning. So we really need, you know, to have good quality data. The other thing is we don't want to work in silos as we've been doing in the past. And a good example, you know, is the no time. You know, we, there is too many no times in the system and they are not integrated. You know, for example, when you have a VOR outage today, you get, you know, five or six different no times for that, you know, telling you that the VOR is out of order, that, you know, the procedures is not available, that the airport and, and, and so on and so on. We want all that information sent in a single message and hopefully the digital age will allow to move towards that. And then finally, we got the impression that a lot of the NSPs are still not aware of, you know, that digital environment which has been created by ICAO. And so we hope, you know, that, let's say, through uh, the work that ICAO will be doing in the coming weeks, we'll have a month, we'll have more uh, awareness and air, the airspace, the, sorry, the air navigation service providers will be able to uh, provide better service to us. So, finally, we have some suggestions on the way forward. 
Well, first of all, improve the quality of your data. You know, and it's, being digital doesn't solve the problem. It helps, you know, it allows us to have better filtering mechanisms, but you have to ensure that your data quality is better. Then every ARM provider should move to digital ARM. You know, for us, it's really important to streamline and have more efficient processes. But we don't ask you know, every ARM provider to do it in one go. You know, just, there are six data sets in the ARM catalog. You could pick up one, do it, and then as soon as you have more than one, start looking at integrating those together to provide better services to the users. And finally, we want to emphasize that the ICO guidance you know, needs to be clearly explaining how ANSPs needs to build their digital ARM systems to support the airspace users' need. And we think that educational seminars you know, could help the ANSPs do their job better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Francois. I think the, uh, the, the red line here is clear. The, the benefits of digital data are uncontested. Uh, there are many that were listed by him, but don't go digital if you haven't first sorted out your quality management, your quality data processes, etc. Because otherwise, again, rubbish in is rubbish out. And a third element that really comes, or what I hear from it, it's not the ICAO SARPs and provisions that are so much here to be questioned. It is much more for the, uh, the states to implement in a harmonized way, to perhaps have some more monitoring on it, to go for more guidance, etc. That said, we've got four questions at the moment in Pigeonhole. Four. Three of them are on digital notam. Come on, you can do better. Yeah? Pigeonhole.at, please send us your questions. The next speaker, uh, very happy to have him on board, is Joachim. Joachim Lennart uh, was CEO of ZIAC AG and Avitech AG. He has joined Frequentis uh, in 2013 as Director of Information Management Service uh, Solutions. Sorry, Joachim. And you're responsible for the Frequentis. Uh, uh, line of products and services on AIM, and he will tell us more about what is it that they have to offer, as well as their experiences, because when, the, when, when you get into reality, that's really when you learn the, the real things. Joachim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everybody. Um, we heard from Paul about uh, all the effort that has been put into AIM on the IKO side. Um, we've seen all the other activities that are going on, and I think in general, we can be very proud of what the domain has achieved in the last decade in, um, in setting the right basis for AAM and in deploying AAM. Um, one thing is the very basis for, for uh, information management, the uh, establishment of, of data standards, of a common data language, so um, data management is possible. Um, the extensibility and flexibility that is needed to accommodate all the different needs of the different stakeholders in the domain. Um, we see that during the last decade, uh, numerous AIM systems have been, have been deployed, so a lot of things have happened, and many ANSPs are actively engaging in the process. So exactly what IATA is, is, is wishing is something that is in the process of happening. So um, we're all very positive and very, um, uh, very happy about what is going on, but at the same time there are challenges and we need to address those challenges as well um, um, because we have to overcome them to get to the next step of, uh, of AIM deployment. One of the main things that we see um, is on the technical side, ironically, one of the main goals that we want to achieve, data interoperability, is something that is a real challenge to a lot of players and to, to all industry players as well. Because the very standards that we have introduced have inherent components in there that we need to streamline, that we need to clear out in order to be able to really exchange data in a way that we have intended to do it um, in AAM. Um, I've listed here some of the main problems that we see in the concept the openness, the very openness of the standard, uh, the roughly structured information, and abuse of the flexibility and abuse of, of extensions that lead to a situation where data is interpreted or, or defined in different ways within a very open standard, and unclear business rules or even the lack thereof. The good thing is this is being addressed right now 
at the AXM CCB in close collaboration between different suppliers, between different players, to really standardize this further uh, to, to build a stronger basis for, for AIM systems. Two main points that have been achieved there, and I think this is very important, is um, the definition of AXM business rules per profile. This means that a standardization is taking place, but at the same time, this is per profile. So it is ensured that the individual needs of certain stakeholders along the digital data chain is still protected as specific profiles that are tailored for it are being used. And the other thing, also very important, is the coding guidelines for different data sets that urgently need to be harmonized uh, because here as well, we have a lot of interpretation that is in the different implementations of different suppliers that are really hindering uh, an open exchange of data. And what will be very important here, we've seen the new documents that will come out, that the new document structures will be reflected in the new standards to really improve the situation on this end. But for a supplier, it's always easy to talk about technical challenges, where we have a lot of clever engineers uh, in, our, in our offices. Um, but really, the main challenge, that, and this is our experience in all of the project, is that it is understood that the roadmap AAM and the, the moving from AAS to AAM um, has a huge impact on the entire organizations. If you reduce it, if you, it is reduced to just a technical aspect, then most probably projects will not work well. Because it needs to be understood, and we've seen this in earlier presentations today, that it's not so much about technology, it's about change management, and it's about creating the needed skills, it's about um, setting up the needed roles, defining the processes that are needed, and preparing yourself for putting in the right systems in the end to help you um, support the new concept that you have put in place. Very important in this context is also the collaboration because I think that it's it, a classical supplier-customer relationship doesn't work here. You need the active engagement of a supplier, you need the active engagement of an end user to bring all the different components together that you find in the AAS to AAM roadmap. The very good thing also is uh, when we talk about collaboration, collaboration is not only limited to the supplier and the ANSP, it's not only limited to, to the establishment of standards between different suppliers, but it's also the collaboration along the digital data chain. And um, we're very excited to see that there a lot of things are happening also, because this movement of AAM is not something that is limited only to ANSPs. We see that a lot of other stakeholders, upstream and downstream along the data chain, are now engaging in the process and are ready to take the advantages of the AAM standards. We see, for example, the, the um, ADV, the organization of the German airports, with 37 airports, they have set their whole originator management on the basis of 5.1. We see that uh, an organization like Qantas um, is going live in the beginning of next year with a very innovative um, route, real-time route optimization manager, uh, an engine that is also based on 5.1. We see that um, Boeing Global Services, Jeppesen, is in the transition to replace proprietary concepts and systems by AXM 5.1 to take the advantage of those standards. And this will nicely fit into the whole digital data chain so we can all really take the advantages of those concepts. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Joachim. Again, clear message. I mean, Going digital does not come without its own technical challenges. Uh, the AXM got mentioned. I mean, AXM, it's a, it's a computerized uh, data model. Uh, it's, a, it's a new territory for many of us in, in ATM. Uh, we had to learn sometimes also the hard way and how to, to, to roll this out globally, how to ensure interoperability amongst the many different vendors that are selling you AXM products and services. 
but your place of call for any of such issues is the AXM CCB, where literally hundreds, if not thousands of people around the world come together, express concerns, and work on solutions all together. And again, and this is not a second or third time that we hear it, it's not only about the technology and the products. Please allocate serious time as well for training your people, make clarifying roles and responsibility, create awareness, make sure management is truly behind your implementation project, etc. We are on 12 questions at the moment. This is good, because I've been following the sessions in the rest of the week. I think we need a couple of more, and then we break the record. Yeah? <laughs> so make this happen. Let's make sure that AM is not the ugly duck. We're the ones that are leading in many different ways this whole ATM modernization. And speaking of which, and speaking of ATM modernization leading, may I please introduce to you Roberta. Roberta is an aeronautical information management technical officer at ICAO. In the last years, her main focus has been to support the creation of standards and procedures for an effective management of the aeronautical information. Her focus is now to support implementation and create a framework to help states and industry to fully transition to AI environment. A big applause to Roberta. We owe her a lot for all the work she's doing. Roberta. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so with this presentation, I will, with this last presentation, I would like to uh, provide an overview of the status of implementation of AIM, existing strengths and challenges that exist with implementation, and also the approach that ICAO is taking in order to uh, support implementation through the development of an ICAO AIM implementation strategy. So let's make a quick assessment of the uh, current status. And overall, we acknowledge good progress by states. So states and regions are taking increasing efforts to um, improve implementation, but we are aware that the same states and the same regions are uh, facing challenges on a daily basis, and this is leading us to work always on better solutions and to continue progressing the work on uh, AIM. So the situation shows that the AIS to AIM transition roadmap, it's still the tool that is used to measure implementation. In most of the regions, actually, the transition roadmap has, has been adapted to meet the regional needs. So regions have set their own indicators and their own regional targets. But it's still the, the tool that is used. And through these measurements, we uh, actually, um, the data shows that as of today, the focus of implementation is still on phase one and two of the roadmap. And then priorities are mostly represented by the implementation of QMS and training and electronic AIP and uh, ETOD. The same data show also that the majority of the regions have uh, not fully implemented phase one and two yet. So which are the main challenges with implementation? First of all, it happens that, unfortunately, AIM is not always considered as much important as other domains. And this is uh, because probably AIM is not promoted enough. And the situation shows also, also that states, not all states are able to perform a quality management review of their processes, and this is causing inefficiencies in the aeronautical data process and potentially quality issues in the aeronautical information products. In some regions, lack of competencies is still an issue, and going digital, the going digital phase, is posing some challenges from an institutional, technical, and economical point of view. So what is the impact of these uh, issues, of these challenges? First of all, safety may be impacted if the information is not right. Cost could increase because of the inefficiencies in the process. And of course, we don't have to forget that AIM is an important prerequisite for the attainment of elements of the global air navigation plan, such as PBN and ACDM and SWIM, for example. But the good news is that we can rely on the existing strengths. So as it was mentioned before, uh, now as a care, we are happy to have this new uh, set of provisions. We have a new restructure, uh, Annex 15, and a new PAN-CIM that support uh, uh, the implementation of AIM, as well as a host of guidance material that we are working on now to further support implementation. 
Additionally, AIM is not new. AIM has been happening for many years. So we have many examples of, of best practices and knowledge of what works and what doesn't. So what is the way forward? Of course, we want to look for a continuous improvement. And now, as you have understood, the focus of AIM is on implementation. So what we need to do is to create a strong framework to support implementation. And that's why ICAO is willing to uh, develop an AIM implementation strategies to address the challenges, but of course also building on the existing strengths. And the key successful factor of this AIM uh, implementation strategy will be a close coordination with the stakeholders from the AIM arena. So it is important that states, service providers, industry, international organizations work together with us to make the implementation strategy effective. So what is, what is it? What is the AIM implementation strategy? The strategy will be a documented action plan to uh, derive improvement in the AIM world. And the AIM implementation strategy will be developed through a project management approach. So we will have a planning phase in which we will identify all the challenges with implementation and we will prioritize them. So we will identify the ones that have to be addressed as a matter of priority. Once the challenges are clear, we will develop an action plan. So when we talk about an action plan, it means that we will try to determine which are the best solutions to address those challenges. And when we talk about solutions, we can span from updating the SARPs, making the guidance material better, creating better awareness about the importance of AIM, and again, working together with you, working together with the stakeholders involved. And of course, once the plan for action will be ready, once the strategy will be ready, we will need to properly measure. So we will develop indicators and metrics to measure implementation and to see how the implementation strategy will be effective. The good news is that we have a new section in ICAO called uh, Program Coordination and Implementation Section that is taking a leading role in uh, this activity and in uh, supporting implementation. But again, the engagement of stakeholders is essential. So quick overview of the uh, time scale. So what are we doing now? Of course, as I said, we are trying to talk with the expert and talk with the stakeholders and gather the different perspective and understand, have a full pictures of the issues and the challenges as of today. So this will happen till beginning of next year, till the end of January, we will collect all the inputs. We had a very interesting session in November. We had an AIM brainstorming session. We had experts from the AIM arena coming here to Montreal and discussing all the challenges with implementation. So we are now in this communication mode and uh, we are planning to um, have by uh, the beginning of March a first draft of the AIM implementation strategy and potentially towards the spring uh, the final draft of the strategy. Once the strategy will be uh, finalized, of course we will uh, move on to the execution of the strategy and we will develop specific AIM implementation project and implement it. The idea is to uh, present the first results of uh, this project at the 13 Air Navigation Conference, which will happen next year in October. So there we want to show results and of course we want to engage more and more people to support us in this activity. So in conclusions, uh, I think that as of now we have good strengths, we have new provisions, we have guidance material, we have plenty of examples all over the world how AIM is progressing, but we need to face these challenges. So uh, there is a need to create a framework to support implementation and ICAO and the AIM stakeholders should work together in close cooperation to define the road ahead. Thank you very much. So beware of the women with the plan. <laughs> okay, I am extremely impressed. Uh, we got, what is it now, 20 questions. 
Yeah, so now comes the bit where we need to manage expectations. Uh, we got seven minutes left, uh, so we will not be answering all of them here live with the, uh, with the panelists, uh, but we will be hanging around afterwards and you can further have a chat with us. And Goberta anyway will take all your questions into account into the implementation strategy that she is developing. So again, thank you, thank you very much, absolutely uh, appreciate it. So now if it all goes well, I can click on a question and it should appear. Is it active that I need to do? Yeah. So, notal perforation. Is there a risk that digital notums would worsen the situation, or could they be used to channel notum over production? Jean-François, let me volunteer you for that question. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Paul. Okay, so th there is no black and white answer to that one. It's true that there is always a risk, you know, that proliferation would increase because people would think that, you know, as I have a digital way to put no time on uh, available, I, you know, everything I want to say, I will use the no time. But you have to understand that today, you know, the proliferation is, in a lot of the cases, a result of bad management. So, you know, moving digital doesn't improve but doesn't make the situation any worse. So, I, I see more, you know, digital no time as a great opportunity to really you know, rationalize how no time are provided. And you know, if you come back to the example I was giving during my presentation, instead of today you know, sending five no times you know, regarding a VOR outage you know, because the VOR is used in, in an approach plate and also serving a wood and structure and whatever, we could have one single message you know, which would allow us to get information in one go. And that's a simple way to reduce proliferation. So I think you know, there are great expectations that instead of getting any, you know, having a worse situation, we might indeed improve it. And the last point I'd like to make is that ICAO, you know, uh, through the activities on stream, is also looking at how services could help you know, provide information which is today made available in the no time in a different way through services. And so that you know, at one stage, in fact, the need for, for no times will s slowly uh, re be reduced and replaced by something a bit more efficient and modern. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean-Francois. Let's go for the next question. Is the AIM held back by the AIP remaining the authoritative document? In the system-to-system -system world of SWIM, what use is the AIP? I think that that is a real good question. Stefan. Thank you for that one. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, I think this is one of the reasons. This is what I mentioned as being the cultural part of the change. The fact that there is this feeling, and I use the, the word on purpose, that paper takes precedence over data. There's no real rational. It's a feeling. We've been doing things like this for years. So, but we should um, also consider that uh, authoritative does not really apply to a document type, but rather to a source. So state remains responsible. The means by which they provide the information is for the time being left to their discretion with a number of options. Paper, electronic, which is not yet data, and digital, which is data sets. And in the uh, recent work of, uh, of ICAO in the ASAM study group, there's been a number of changes uh, and the, uh, the shortly to come, new uh, Annex 15 and Pan same include provisions that should clarify all this and help moving forward by making a clear separation between provisions applicable to paper, electronic, and digital. By having a data catalog that lists all the data that fall within the scope of article information. By also, and that's linked to the second part of the question, uh, creating what is called an AIP data set. So what is that? This is all the data that you find in an AIP, but to be provided a la SWIM in the form of data sets. And there is also one thing that I strongly believe is, is good, which is an incentive for the providers. So if you, because the providers like my organization would say, okay, it's good, the digital data set, et cetera, but why the pain of having digital data set in addition to the AIP? Because in France, we consider we are still gonna release an AIP. Well, ICO in this study group was smart enough to give an incentive by saying, if you do provide a data set, 
you may or may not continue to provide the equivalent section in the AIP. I'll give you an example. We've got 30 pages of obstacle in en route in France, 30 pages of data. It's easy to get this data in the form of a data set. Instead of these 30 pages, we could have only one reference to a website that includes this data set. This is now going to be feasible in accordance with the ICO itself. So I think we are moving forward into this direction with the recent work of ICO, of course, to be continued with uh, awareness about this and more training about how this can be implemented. Thank you, Stefan. I mean, that we had a lot of debate in this group, uh, study group on this, and I think we came to a very reasonable agreement uh, in the end. And so I'm really looking forward to the publication of this new Annex 15. Uh, Roberta, the question whether you got enough salary, I think we'll park that for the moment. But you have friends in the room. I think that's, that's clear. Uh, I'd like to squeeze two more questions out of this session here, if possible. Next one is for you, Joachim. Can a global digital NOTAM system be achieved unless SWIM is deployed globally? Thank you, Paul. Um, basically, um, SWIM with its microservices will definitely enhance um, the access of data, the access of co to correct data, to the same data for, for all the players. And uh, this is, of course, very important. And this is, of course, very important for digital notum as well, because there you have to have the same references, you have to have this access to, to, to the same data. But at the same time, there, there are other mechanisms that, that would allow you to achieve this, um, uh, this situation. So um, I believe that SWIM is not really the prerequisite for digital notam, but it will certainly help to, to put digital notam in place because those developments, they're going in parallel at the same time. Yep. So I think that, that uh, both concepts are really going into, going into the same direction. They're playing hand in hand, but uh, we will have to see how things develop. Okay, thank you very much. And if you got some free time, at the stands on the fourth floor, you will see there one of the stands from the European side of things where we have a tool there that shows and visualizes for you all the countries that are now distributing digital aeronautical information, including digital notes from FAA and others, etc. So don't hesitate to go and visit that stand. Let's try to get one more question out of the system. And let's pick this one. Does the panel think that AIM data should be made available for free globally in the same way that the AIP is today? Some ANSP do this today, but others charge. Any of you in the panel? <laughs> because I'm, not, I'm looking forward to the, the, the answers to that one. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know who uh, was led to believe that it's free, you know, um, <laughs> because us airlines, we pay for that information. We may not pay for it directly, but, you know, the user charges include the, the service being delivered by the NSP, so it's not free. What, I, what we would hope is that it won't cost more, you know, because we are moving digital. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the NSP in the room. <laughs> Stefan. Well, I touched upon this question by saying that maybe there's a minimum AIP, AI, AI data set to be provided by all states that we as a community agree to. There are more and more requests for AI data uh, in the broad sense of the term AI, and some of these data require a lot of effort and they will probably not come for free. Uh, yet, I understand Jean-Francois's point, and I think m the bulk of what we've got in the AIP today should be free in a digital context. But if we keep adding on new AI data to support a number of advanced operations, that's another debate. Maybe one input <laughs> from my side also. Um, <clears throat> I believe that um, for AIM to progress, it's important to have the right incentives in place. I think AM will not progress if certain players uh, along the digital data chain do not have an incentive to move there if, if you have to put in force to force them to do it. So I think also one aspect of as an incentive is the commercial aspect. And I think we need to find the right balance to, to compensate um, the work that is put into things um, also commercially, but of course in a way that uh, we have a win-win situation that uh, all the players along the digital data chain uh, take advantage of, of what we're doing here. Yep. 
Yeah, I think that can be the, 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 the subject of a conference on its own, this whole commercialization of ATM, etc. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Maybe one very last one, just for Roberta, a quick answer. What support can members and industry provide to support ICAO in their AS to AM efforts? What can we do for you, Roberta? Thank you very much for the question. Um, well, I think this is exactly what we are trying to do with this effort of creating an AIM implementation strategy. We would like to work more and more uh, together with the stakeholders involved. And there are different types of cooperation I mean, that we, we can consider. In general, it's voluntary work. And so we believe that we want to involve uh, stakeholders on a voluntary basis because we believe that it's beneficial for everybody to work on a strategy to support implementation. There are different activities that we could consider. It depends on the type of solution that we are going to uh, determine for the challenges that we have. So if the solution would be, for example, to improve the standards and the recommended practices, they would, this would mean, for example, to recreate, for example, an AIM uh, group at the ICAO level. In that case, we would need your expertise in order to make these uh, provisions better. Um, another idea that, for example, we are thinking is to uh, establish GO teams. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the PBN GO teams, but it's basically a group of experts that are composed of different expertise, international organizations and industry and ICAO itself, that could outreach to states and help them in developing an action plan for, for implementation. So that could be another, another option. And guidance material is, uh, is paramount. So any sort of support that we could get uh, and contribution that we would, could have from your side would be only beneficial. Okay, I think we've finished the session here. I think in 45 minutes, I mean, we got squeezed a bit here. Uh, we need to work on that for the next time. Uh, we were able to give you an overview uh, of the, I think, still tremendous overhaul of the Annex 15 that has taken place over the last years. I did not hear from the many different questions that more SARPs or many different SARPs are urgently required. From what I do gather, more guidance is required, more support is required. An implementation strategy, I think, is absolutely welcome to help the whole state move forward on this uh, with, the, with the right pace and the support, the whole GAMP that is truly depending on digital data wherever you look in ATM. So thanks again for all the speakers. Thanks for all of you for your 20 plus questions and see you next time. <laughs>
regulation done between them, letter of agreements. There, there is no, no problem with it that I can see. Is that something that's already been discussed? Not that I know of. For we, we, we haven't reached that level of trust, that's what you're saying, but we'll come to that point. No, we, we, have, we have a lot of work to do with our own towers, so, so for, for my part, it, it hasn't been an issue yet. Okay. I can maybe, Michael, just fill in. I think this, this is a relevant question, and, and I, since we are working on, on, on a global scale, we see these things being discussed all over the place, and the question being asked, and how can that happen? And, and I think it's just a matter of time and maturity. Someone has to take the first step and make it happen, and then it will probably be linked to this business model type of, of discussion, how that will look like, and, and that, that, then it will happen. Thank you very much. I, and I think in terms of ICAO provision, you already know that you have delegation of air traffic services. So it's not a, an issue about ICAO provision, it's more about business value and will. i close that one. And then uh, I, I just got to go to the one which says, in Sweden, are there requirements to record visual data for safety investigation purposes? Um, no, it's not. The regulations are the same as for, as for, for a conventional tower. However, we, we do record all the visual data just for, 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 um, for having the data for investigations and, and just learning about how, how we work and, and how to do it even better. Okay, thank you. You know, it's, nothing is preventing you to raise your hand. I can always kick you in into the discussion. So, so don't sit there and wait me to go through all the questions here. Pop up if there's something you think uh, we need to, to pick up on from here. Now, I'd like to go to Andy uh, and Nats and about the, the plans uh, of implementing TBS or the recategorization of wake separation. The TBS specifically, or possibly wake or recat. Are there any other plans to do that at other UK airports? Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, so, yes, there are. Uh, the uh, PCP implementing rule requires uh, TBS to be implemented at Manchester and Gatwick. Uh, Gatwick's quite an interesting case because uh, it's a mixed mode single runway airfield. It's already running um, at uh, uh, scheduled at 55 movements an hour um, by uh, putting TBS in there um, with optimized runway delivery. Um, we can see about two additional movements an hour or possibly three additional movements an hour um, by optimizing the arrival spacing um, to match the departure runway occupancy. So um, that will happen um, at some point during the next control period, time scale to be uh, defined. There's some other airports within the UK that are also looking to um, implement similar. Um, and we've had... Um, quite a bit of, uh, of interest from other airfields around the world. Um, now that's um, primarily those that are uh, capacity constrained, but also airfields which uh, have significant peaks, um, you know, at the, uh, uh, the busier times of the day. Thank you, Andy. And I guess it's also, uh, also about a question of what type of aircraft fly into the airport. It's very homogenous, it might not be that useful, but if it's different flight types or aircraft types, it might be more useful, right? Yeah, so certainly the, the benefits depend um, in part on the weight vortex mix that you have coming into the airfield, uh, but um, the uh, one of the benefits that you see is, um, so, uh, you know, the controllers at Heathrow, for example, were very good and are very good at what they do. Um, on final approach, but you do start to see an improvement in the consistency of service delivery. Um, so, but the biggest benefits, yes, can be uh, be delivered where you have a mix of heavy uh, and medium movements. Thank you, Andy. No questions from the floor. Everyone's quiet for the time being. So, I was going to ask Michaelo a question here. Um, what is the proportion of users using the free route air, airspace capabilities and actually filing flight plans using these new capabilities? Yes, well, thank you. I think it's a very good question. We, we did uh, see some issues with this problem in the first days of implementation. 
but gradually uh, when the operators started picking up these possibilities, uh, the situation went better. I think you could say today after a uh, whole summer season behind us uh, in the Southeast Access Free Route airspace, that's more than 70% of the users are actually using the, the free route capabilities. But this is also one of the reasons why we claimed in the extension uh, project uh, that uh, we need to involve the stakeholders uh, early, particularly the flight plan system providers and the network manager in order for them to be quite sure what kind of possibilities and capabilities the free route uh, we are offering is offering to them. Okay. Thank you, Mikhailo. Oh, there's a hand here. Thank you. Kari, floor is yours. Yeah, it's, uh, good. Well, good morning or almost afternoon, everybody. I'm Kari Siekinen from Finnish Transport Safety Agency, and I work closely with uh, Borealis Free Route Airspace Issues as the chairman of the nine state group. Uh, just tempted to come back to this question itself. It's a, uh, it's, it's a tricky one, actually because the, how do you measure that? In, at least in Borealis area, we've had this discussion. I mean, you have options. You, we, we basically, in the northern part of Europe, uh, the routings have been very direct from the, to start with. And there's an ATS network below the free route airspace. So from the user point of view, you can choose. You can choose to file through the ATS network or something else. It is your choice, free choice, free route. What do you measure? I, I mean, I mean, th th this is part of the problem. I mean, we've, we've been uh, having this discussion a lot. I mean, we've been measuring something in the beginning. We measured that, okay, maybe 20% of the flights use the free route, but we can't really say because they can actually choose whatever route they want, even the ATS route. So just wanted to say that, that the, the, the just the question itself, it's a bit difficult in some parts of the world, at least. Thank you for that question. Who wants to? Mikhailo? Yes, well, I, I can just give an answer from my own hand experience. I, I don't think we have any exact data. You're right about this, uh, on measuring this. Uh, it was uh, quite uh, strange for us to have, having to see these plans uh, pass through altogether even though we uh, pub published a completely new uh, context of, context of uh, airspace. So that, uh, yes, the, some operators are still uh, using uh, the fixed points, I would call them like this anymore, because we don't have any more routes available, but they're using them uh, as normal uh, planning, uh, planning points that we have published in our airspace uh, to fly, which correspond with uh, some kind of a fixed route network, but uh, what we are seeing definitely is uh, more and more of them uh, using the direct options uh, as much as possible that are uh, being offered. So I think this is a trend which will, uh, which will continue in our airspace. Can I swing that question across to Joe, uh, seeing that from a network management perspective? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think one point already made was the, the influence of the the flight plan service providers for airlines. You know, we, we know that not all of them are at the same level. Some require software upgrade to their own systems to be able to cope with, with free route. So I think that's, that's one element where we have learned as network manager where we have to receive and process the flight plans that, that are uh, based on a free route uh, environment. And we, we have these discussions with the flight plan service providers, which basically um, we've learned the lesson that we have to involve them, you know, at the start of this process. Uh, and whenever there is a new implementation, now we, we, go, we go well ahead with them and they are even part of the validation of that airspace. So I think that's an important point. I think the second point, and it may be specific to Europe, is the different route charges that are from the different states. So even though it's free route, yeah, it is exactly free route. So one of the calculations that uh, that airlines will make, you know, with the, the good software or the, the the right software is basically which route will give me the cheapest uh, charges, uh, will incur the lowest charges. 
So the free is also uh, related, uh, is used in that context. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, what is uh, a, 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 the most important thing for me is the predictability. The, the, you know, if the flight plan is what you actually are going to fly, then ATM we can handle that. But if we go in a future with 4D trajectories, with uh, with <coughs> ATM systems which are able to to plan ahead and and, and leave the controller only the, the the I would say the 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 on the spot you know issues, but but everything is 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 through the the systems and data being exchanged that the plan is there and the the the, the 4D trajectory is well calculated into the system. Um, the important thing is whatever is on the flight plan, whatever is in front of a controller as the, the route that is being to be followed is followed, and I think that is that is you know one of the the, the things that, that that certainly in Europe we we, we struggle a bit because uh, we are working our systems for 4D, be ready for 4D trajectories, but in reality. Um, what is actually flown is sometimes different from what is actually planned. So, uh, free route airspace gives more options for the planning options, which ma should make it should make it easier to plan what you actually are really going to do. Thank you, Joe. I, I was looking at Jean Francois from IATA, but I'm not going to put him on the spot. But but he might think of it for the future because it would be interesting to hear the airline's view of this with free routes and. What are the things we need to think of? How do we get the flight plan service providers to better kick into the system? And not the, not the least the question raised about it's based on route charges there. Will we ever see a system in the future that will be service-based and where you pick things up in the right way, where it's transparent, and where your flight plan, which I think we're talking about, is the elephant in the room here. The flight plan we're having today is not to the level where it needs to be to create that transparency from planning all the way through execution so that everyone can do this in a data-rich environment and connect, by the way, the aeronautical information or meta information to it the way we'd like it to be. Look, I'm sorry to be that long on, on this one, but uh, uh, let me go back a little bit on that, unless Jean-Francois, you're ready to, to comment on it. Well, in fact, I was about to send a question, so since you give me the floor. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that, you know, some groups of NSPs in Europe are starting to provide free route, you know, because let's say for the airspace users, that's a good step forward to improve efficiency. So my question is, you know, are there any plan to have all of Europe, you know, providing free route airspace above a certain flight level? And on the question of the flight planning, let's say the airspace users, yes, you're right, you know, Joe, some of them still have, you know, to make changes to their systems, you know, to be able to support that kind of airspace. But let's say, they will do that as soon as they see that there is a clear benefit. You know, if it's something which is just provided, you know, once in a while, the investment might be just might not be justifying the cost. But if they start more and more NSPs, you know, providing that kind of improvements, I'm sure that they will make the change. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Francois. Joe, I think to answer the first question about when, uh, I think uh, we know the concrete plans of each NSP because we, we have to make a system change, an airspace change uh, and uh, in, our, in our database so that we can process the flight plans. And I think, um, I would say 90% of the airspace will be free route by 2021, 2022. Uh, uh, we already have a significant part today. I would say half the airspace today is some sort of free route. Sometimes it's only at night, sometimes it's at the weekends. In other countries, in other groups of countries, it's, it's, it's H24, so it is progressing. Uh, but I would say four or five years, you would see all of Europe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let me stay uh, on that free routes a little bit. And, and a question to, to Rainier, which I had somewhere here. How, how do you handle the uh, safety management across so many ANSPs involved? Uh, well, as I presented uh, in my presentation today, we, we, um, uh, the setup is so that we are working on the overall concept uh, collectively within the Borealis Alliance, but for the local implementation, it's the responsibility of the uh, particular ANSP. And uh, there, we have nine ANSPs who are all certified, their SMS systems are all certified by the same rules, so they should be... Um, 
uh, should be, uh, you know, e e equal and, and, and fulfill the same requirements. So what was decided to do is that each and every uh, ANSP uh, would um, uh, present their implementations uh, uh, locally with their local NSAs. But having said that, th that is the details, that is a, uh, certified known processes that we are following there. But on top of that, for the alliance, we had to ha have um, a good coordination with the NSAs. The, there was a setup of uh, a nine state NSA group uh, uh, with representatives from all the NSAs. They are coordinating amongst themselves, and we coordinate with them. And I think um, here uh, the important thing is that uh, you, uh, 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 people are aware of what is going to happen. But I think the basic principle was there. Like I said, one size does not fit all. We were, we were collectively working on the overall concept and the goals and the communication and coordination. But uh, for each local implementation, it was the processes already established uh, which were used there. Thank you, Rainier. I think it poses an important point here. You know, when you, when you kickstart and do things together, you bring in the local regulators and you sort of create an environment where regulators and state authorities start working together. And I would assume that, you know, even from a state and regulatory perspective, you, you'd be happy to be in very early in the process. On one hand, to give the tricky questions back to the ones that wants to do something, but also to be there and have awareness, as you said. But you've got to keep that stability between who's doing something and the one that regulates. But when you're developing, I think it should be a very free environment of working together. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, um, uh, my key points are uh, actually to involve all the stakeholders early, like you say, and you have to build up trust between the parties. And, and uh, uh, bottom line is that uh, it all boils down to the people who are involved. And I, um, uh, uh, and also maybe there was a bit of a luxury within this alliance that there are people involved who have been working together for many years, so the trust was already established uh, from previous uh, projects and, 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 and from history. Thank you, Rainy. Any hands? <clears throat> Let me turn to, to Diana uh, on the SWIM part that we heard about the SWIM global demonstrations. Uh, what are the shortfalls, challenges, but even opportunities you've seen or encountered when you move the ideas through the research to demonstrations and then into different implementation levels? Thank you, Michael. One of the things that we encounter when we're starting off on this project, we, we said ICAO subscribe, is asking for SWIM, and, and SWIM should be interoperable globally. Um, it's the messaging. It, people recognize SWIM, or, or the word SWIM, but how do we message to the community uh, on what SWIM is and what's the benefit? So we did a quite a bit of discussion or, or, or going out and, and have conversation. We have to recognize that we have to message this to multiple stakeholders. For the, for the leaderships, the, the management, it's the cost benefits. How do we evolve from where we are today and, and into the future? And that's, there's a the reduction in cost and there's a benefit. There's also a concern about the security of the data. Um, how do we govern policies and regulations? So we have to address those um, at, at a local level, regional level, and, and global level. The other side is the operations personnel. Um, it is very important. SWIM is IT. Uh, the engineers in us are, gets really excited about the IT, but the operations folks do not see the benefit. So you have to craft your message in a way that why timely access to information will help make the operation more efficient, and it reduces the, the, the friction that we have in terms of multiple steps just to get information to the right user at the right time. So those were the challenges that we saw, and it took us a while to figure out how to get that message out to the different kind of stakeholders in, in, in language and, and, and focus area that they're interested in.
Good. Uh, any anything specific on the <coughs> on the global? You showed us a picture of the global work together with other partners. So you were talking about the wordings and vocabulary. And, and I, one thing I've come across when you work across borders with different regions is that we use wordings in a different way. Uh, we can say implementation in in one place, and we say deployment in Europe, and we have we have that kind of discussion everywhere. But have you seen anything specific in in your demonstration in terms of? understanding our, our regional differences in the way we use our wordings and speak to get to the page where we are actually speaking the same language. Speaking in the same language is very important and, and we, we did encounter some of that. Um, and it is important for us then to go back to, to the, the global documents, the ICAO documents, the, the guidance material, so that we can all point back to this is what we meant. Um, that was a challenge to, to start with, and it is something that you, you have to get, um, get right in, in the beginning. But I looked at ICAO, um, such as Ganus and, and uh, this sort of forum, to help message it to provide the guidance material um, to the level of detail so that it, we, it's not up to a lot of interpretation. So the basic vocabulary, basic think, basic concept, and document it there so that we, we, can, we have a quick start to, to, to talking the same language. Thank you very much, Diana. Let me, uh, let me turn to, to Paul. We just had the AIM session. How, how do you, what do you see, or what would you like to see as, a, as an immediate change uh, as a result of this AIM implementation strategy? And how do you see that in the context of what we heard that we're going services, services, services? Uh, AIM surely is not the end goal. There's something going beyond that. Thank you, Michael. I think, well, the first thing that we expect from an implementation strategy is implementation. I think that's that really must be the, the key focus. Uh, what Roberta, I think, made clear as well, it is no point uh, going for sophisticated systems and digitalization if you haven't got your, in, uh, your house internally in order. Yeah? So make sure that your quality processes are there, make sure your roles and responsibilities are clear, uh, and then start going into digitalization uh, of your data sets, et cetera. Um, and then if you say, well, what's, what's the end goal? It is for also the AIM world to increasingly provide its data, uh, be it static data with data sets or dynamic data with NOTAM, uh, through SWIM. Yeah? I think that's really what we expect. If you read the GAMP, already the previous version, but even more so in, in the upcoming version, it's completely reliant on di full digitalized AIM, Meteo, and flight data. And through the SWIM demo global demonstrations that we did, we have shown that technically this can work. We have been able to show the benefits, the operational benefits, uh, and AIM needs to play its part. And I think that's why it's so vitally important that we really get on now with this uh, implementation strategy. Which means AIM grows into ATM because the biggest core source of data here would be the flight, mm -hmm. actually, and the flight data. Yep. Right. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, take one of the questions. There are lots of questions on remote towers here, and I didn't want it to be a remote tower session, but, but uh, some of them are, are interesting. So I'd, I'd like just to pick one uh, in terms of research. What research has been done into the air traffic controllers or the flight information officers in terms of fatigue uh, when watching screens for uh, an extended period of time? Uh, I see Nicholas is eager to get the uh, microphone, so please, you, you go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe use my, my, my link to CSR in the background. I, I think this, this, in general, if you look at the research, uh, the, the, sort of the technical things are sort of more or less done, I think. There are things there. A lot of the, now it's about the human factors mm -hmm. aspects, everything from how you plan and how you work in, in these, including how you design your, your screens and all these kind of things. So, so uh, I, I know that, that the, 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 the future will see a lot of more also uh, research on, on, on fatigue. It, it is on the agenda and it's part of the approval process that you have to check mm -hmm. or make evidence that, that there is no impact of fatigue. Um, I, I know also that, that the, these are part of the, 
the day day to day work sort of to keep track of of, of that and and there are, if there are signs you you note that and take that on board so it, but again the reason why I'm so eager is that because this human factor is something you really need to keep track on and, and make sure you have a lot of, of solid academic research uh, to back up your expansion or diversion in diff different directions of remote tower. Can I get that question across to Jean-Francois on, on, from a controller's perspective? Because I, I would assume you know, we've been looking into radar screens for a number of years through the normal work, and there must be a lot of work being done from your side in terms of being fatigued in a working position. Jean-Francois. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I think you're right, and this is something we'll have to look at in the future, because at present we've had situations where mainly radar controllers were looking at screens for long periods of times. Uh, either approach or area, but now we're uh, developing those remote towers and this is not the same, you've seen them on the picture, we're not talking about the same size of screen at all, not the same distance and not the same use. And uh, if Atka is currently studying that, seeing what are the impacts and um, the way you develop those systems can influence, I believe, the efficiency that will you will gain from it. If, if the system is designed in a user-friendly manner with the screen showing the appropriate information uh, and it is easy to access for the controller, then we gain an efficiency and safety. Um, I've seen some of the demos of, uh, I don't think it was yours, but I've seen a couple of demos of those remote towers and the screens, the quality of the, of the screens is just unbelievable. Uh, the quality is good and the, the options the, that are offered by those systems are just, uh, I think they are endless. Um, I think what we have to look at is, as you mentioned, human factors. Uh, what is the perception of distances? What, what does, uh, let's say, fog and darkness and different lights on the airport, what, what kind of effect it has on human factor and perception of things? from a controller who was used to look outside the window, who's now looking at screens. Thank you, interesting. Jacob? Uh, you also have to consider how much traffic you have and how you use the screens. As you said, the, the distance and, and the difference in size of screens. But if you have a lot of traffic, you will have other problems sitting there for a long time. You'll get tired from, from other things. Maybe you change your personnel more often. If you don't have that traffic load, that changes also how you watch the screen. So it's not just watching the screen, it's, it's in a context with the lighting and traffic load and everything. I remember what, coming to a remote tower installation, someone told me they'd been working the screens there all during the day, and suddenly someone from the airfield called up and said, can you turn on the runway lighting, please, because it's dark out. Outside and inside that tower, it was daylight. So, that there are things happening when you go into this kind of situation that you need to think of. So, in terms of alerts, uh, not necessarily being fatigued, but I was just thinking that one when you spoke. Look, uh, I'd like to to uh, move on to one of the other questions, which I thought was very interesting in here. Um, let me see if I can find it again on. Uh, There was, there was a question, I can't find it just now in here, but it's for, for you, Jean-Francois. What's your, have I got a hand? I do. Michael, if you allow me, uh, this is Hans Keller from DLR German Aerospace Center. Um, coming back to the fatigue uh, aspect, I don't want to dig into the details of that, but uh, we have done research in remote tower and we uh, initially, initially um, invented that idea 2002 as a research uh, topic uh, in DLR and we do hold some patents on that and anything like that. But uh, coming back from that point, with regards to fatigue, there's one specific thing, the refreshment rate of these um, visuals. And this is coming to fatigue finally. And we have started research on, set on that in 2002 and we still have some, some uh, valid information about uh, um, uh, getting tired uh, sitting in front of these screens. So it, there will be a trade-off between the refreshment rate of these screens, meaning how many data you can transfer um, to the controller's working position and um, what, what is the price of that. And there, there will be a trade-off between the quality that you can provide to the controller and the quality that you are willing and can pay for uh, in terms of transmission of these information. 
Is it a generational issue as well? Because I can say my daughter, she spends about eight, nine hours a day in front of a screen. She doesn't seem to be fatigued at all. I don't know. Just a, just this a is, personal reflection. This is definitely the case. And if you allow me, I just want to come back to the um, Guinness wrap-up, uh, where there was a statement that we should involve more younger people in all of these questions. When we started in 2002 with the remote tower, it was that we asked ANSPs to come to us and discuss with us this, this idea. And believe me or not, all of the ANSPs we asked, they say this will never happen, never. And now look around and you see what is going on in that. Uh, so, so I would really would like to ask everyone who is younger than me with my gray hairs, and a lot of these very experienced people around here, I don't want to be unpolite, but we have to ask the younger generation uh, and challenge us, challenge us on these topics, and then we go forward. Thank you, Carla. Uh, let me move to Jean-Francois again. I, I wanted to ask you a question, which I know is not easy, but what is your view on, on trajectory-based operations and what we see coming out of FFIs we've heard a lot of? Uh, what, is a disc what is the discussion and what are the issues coming out from the controller community on that one? This is indeed a very tricky question. Uh, and I would like to say that I'm not the expert on ATM or PP. We have a guy who is a genius on that. And whenever he tells me about what they're doing in the panel, I find it sometimes complicated. Uh, I, the things I know is that the ground to ground part will be first and then uh, air ground will be next. And I would, I would love to see in the future that uh, controllers will be able to provide a better service uh, with uh, TBO. Uh, the fact that today we do not have necessarily all the information uh, available at the controller's position uh, sort of limits us in the decisions we can take. And I think it's the same for the pilots as well. Uh, we're talking, I, the, the way I see TBO personally is really it will be a sort of real-time, live uh, environment where the data is accessible when you need it to take the best decisions. We've seen many examples. I, I think um, it was yesterday, the example of a route, it seemed to be from Brussels to Portugal and there were military areas that were released earlier and things like that. We, we already do that uh, today, but maybe we don't do it the best way or the most efficient way. And to have things centralized will, of course, uh, help controllers take better decisions. And being from Canada, I have a very big country that has only one ANSP. I can just see how in Europe it would change things with smaller countries and a lot more actors involved. If that answers your question a little bit. It does. Any reactions on TBO and FFIs from the audience and what you heard from Jean-Francois? Or anyone from the panel? What do you think? Is TBO clear? Does everyone understand what it means? I don't see a lot of nodding heads. Steve, you got it. You understand it. I think. I, I think. You know, if it's something which is important, I think is that all these things we talk about TBO or we heard about SWIM. It's time to to start moving on and, and understanding that. The way we speak about it on, on my side of things. Uh, we say, look, it's like going from airspace based way of thinking into flight centric way of operating. You heard Joe talking about the flights and how that comes together. So I think it's just as simple as that. But uh, it's also important that out of this TBO work, it comes out something which speaks to the layman out there so we, everyone understands what this means. And it's a typical thing about language. Uh, when we say TBO, let's try and avoid the fact that it becomes a buzzword. And let's move on into something which is very, very concrete. Now, we've only got five... No, I've got Steve here with two hands, which means two questions, right? No, I just wanted to add, okay, I heard a lot of TBO conversation on this panel. I heard Joe talk about the ability to plan because he has all this information. What is he using it to plan? He's using a better understanding of the intent of the aircraft because I'm sharing the information. So, I mean, when we talk about TBO, we're really just talking about expanding the, the fidelity and the use of the information beyond where we currently have with the flight plan. And so almost everybody up there had some aspect of TBO. And it's all about better, tr better information about what the flight's going to do or what we're going to do to the flight so that everybody can coordinate and plan better. It's all based on information. 
Um, we've always been trajectory based, but it was a lack of information that meant that we could actually coordinate the trajectories we had. And that's that was what I think. No, I, I agree with you, Steve. I also think it's a matter of we're talking about a holistic system according to the uh, global ATM operational concept. It's about bringing all the pieces up in the air and the capabilities with the capabilities on the ground and then focusing on the flight because that will go without saying that we're here to service a trajectory from point A to point B as efficient as ever possible. But it is a collaboration, not only in the planning but through its execution. So. Anyway, there's, there's more to say about TBO, but I think it, if it's one thing we need to be start to be clear on is what does TBO mean and how does in data and information and services fit into the context. Look, we only got a couple of minutes left. I intend to, to wrap up here uh, and to thank all the panelists and, and thank you for the questions you post here. Uh, but I'd like to take with me for the, the wrap up session later on that We've learned quite a lot from pioneering things, from moving things from ideas through concepts all the way up to and including implementations and working together. I think it's a theme that goes across all the way. Early collaboration, bringing all the people, not only the ones that are going to do the services or the ones that we service, but also bringing the regulators early into the process. Start small was another thing which came very, very clearly across that don't wait until the big thing is there It'll start small and remember one size does not fit all but there are some main principles in these pioneers that you've heard that you can apply and go back home to work with now maybe uh, my last comment on that with implementation the sooner we focus on the implementation of it through the developments the better it is because we get more and more concrete and we can actually get to a point if we do that where you make sure that your last 10% of a project doesn't take 90% of the time, as it very often does, and try and do that very early. Be concrete where you're going to do it, focus on that one and take your way through it. Otherwise, there's a risk when you apply your standards, you apply your plans into it, that suddenly you realize that all the plans were nice, but there's so much work to do elsewhere than before we can actually take it into operations. I get some other points here, but knowing that we're getting up to half and it's time to break, uh, I will take this into consideration. And if you join us later on into the um, Sani's wrap-up session, I think it's called, which is at two o'clock in the assembly hall. And uh, before you come there, two o'clock, although there will be lunch served on the fourth floor foyer, and two o'clock sharp. Thank you very much, and thank you all the panelists.